Hi, everyone. So thank you and welcome officially to our Quentuhan with Cambio and Co. Uh, featuring Reese Fernandez Ruiz, who is the co-founder of Rags to Riches. And tonight we are talking about joyful resilience. Um, if you are not familiar with us and our work yet, Cambio and Co, we are an ethical fashion company that is based here in Toronto, um, also known as Sicaranto. And we work with uh, we work with Filipino artisans and our mission is specifically to create sustainable livelihood for Filipino artisans and celebrate Filipino craftsmanship while also providing tangible ways for Filipinos in the diaspora to reconnect with our heritage. Um, our rallying cry is actually wear your heritage and it's because we believe there's so much power in being able to wear pieces that are not only designed and handcrafted in the Philippines but that share our stories in meaningful and intentional ways and that really in and in really empowering ways as well. So where your heritage is, you know, it's become a global movement that connects Filipinos to our roots through Filipino fashion, beauty, and culture. And I would love to invite you all um, today to, yeah, to make, like Nikki has said, um, to tag us at Cambio underscore co and use the hashtag where your heritage across our socials, um, because we would love to reshare you and your insights and your learnings. Um, tonight with our community because there's just, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of learning, um, and just a lot of collective wisdom in this group today. So please do tag us and we will make sure to reshare. And to just introduce you to our team today and who we are as individuals. So this is the team behind Cambio & Co. A lot of people think we are bigger than we are, but we are a small team. Um, there's mainly three of us. So we've got Nikki here, who is a community storyteller based in Manila. So she's there waving um, and she is the genius and the wonderful creative human behind our socials and so much of our storytelling with Cambio. Um, so if you have been messaging us on Instagram, she is often the person who you are speaking with. Uh, we also have Jerome, who is Cambio and Co's co-founder, and of course, um, also my life partner slash spouse. So it has been a, an honor to be working together um, over the last five years to to build something that has become so meaningful for so many people. Um, and the two of them, so Nikki and Jerome, are both behind the scenes, and they are. Um, they will be responding to some of your messages. Um, if you have questions, if there's any issues at all, if you get logged out at any point in time during tonight's session, you can DM us or email us on any channel that we have available and one of them will get to you. And of course, um, yeah, if you have questions as well, you can message um, the person here where it says Cambio and Co, brackets Jerome, you can message uh, him and he, and that's Jerome and he'll respond to you. And then of course there's me as well. I almost forgot <laughs> to introduce myself. So my name is Jelaine Santiago. Um, I am Cambion Co's co-founder. Uh, Jerome and I, we are based in Toronto, in what's colonially known as Toronto, um, and which is originally Toronto. And um, for myself, I am an, a social entrepreneur. I am an online storyteller and I'm a writer and sharing stories to inspire positive change and sharing stories that uplift our community is truly one of my passions. And it's an honor to be able to do this work and be with you all in community today. All right, and before we really get into our topic, um, you know, if we're talking about uplifting the culture, we have to talk about uplifting and being in solidarity with indigenous people, past and present. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the living history of the land that we're gathering on today and acknowledge that we are gathering on today as guests of the traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat peoples, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We acknowledge that long before European settlers arrived and stole this land, which is known by its colonial name of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this territory was the subject of the One Dish, One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Ojibwe, and Allied Nations. And today this land continues to be home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, colonially known as North America. And so today is actually um, what is known as Orange Shirt Day, which is a day in 
Canada, where we have to, where we acknowledge and try to um, try to heal from our history of residential schools here in Canada. So residential schools is are a system where 150,000 Indigenous children were actually taken from their families and put into these schools where they were subjected to extreme violence and a mortality rate of about 60 of 60 percent of those children never made it out of the schools. Um, there were over 130 residential schools in, in and across Canada and the last school actually closed as recently as 1996. And so it's important to acknowledge that this land acknowledgement is really just the first step. It's the first step to learn about our history, but what's equally or even more important is to understand and ally ourselves with the indigenous communities who continue to exist today and who are fighting for their liberation today and, and making sure that we are taking steps to not only learn our history, but to move forward in action and in solidarity. And of course, so related to that is um, being in solidarity with the Black liberation movement and standing in solidarity with the Black community. And we also do stand in solidarity with our friends, our family, our Gababayan and fellow Filipinos as they also continue to fight oppression in the homeland to this very day. Okay, and then that relates, of course, to our topic, which is all about joyful resilience. So this question of, you know, how do we actually foster joy and resilience um, during such difficult circumstances when the world is just truly so dark and, um, yeah, so dark and uncertain, like how can we possibly think about joy? Um, you know, I totally feel, I feel like so many of us these days, like we're feeling drained, we're feeling so tired and it's hard to, it's hard to sleep, it's hard to get up in the mornings and so joy might even be one of those last things that we might even want to feel these days um but as i was preparing for this Quentuhan, actually i found this article and it was talking about joy as an act of resistance and so um nikki is going to drop the link to this article in the chat um because it's such a good article that i hope you'll have a chance to check it out it's just so so good and i'll read you a little little excerpt about it so joy as an act of resistance. What dictators know is that joy has a propulsive force and that anything that gathers and channels that energy threatens to upend the rigid control of a population. Music, dance, art, eroticism, all of these things fuel an emotional response that creates momentum, one that can be hard to control. So from this, it's clear like that our joy is not just for ourselves, but our joy is for our communities. Our joy itself is important in order to build resilience, but more importantly, to continue to create acts of resistance and to build a world that we can all really, really be proud of. And so thank you all for being here. And thank you to our partner, Rags to Riches, for weaving joyful stories with us. Um, so for those of you who are new to the story of Rags to Riches, I'm so excited and honored to be the one to be able to introduce their story to you. But Rags to Riches is a fashion and design house empowering community artisans in the Philippines. They've been around for the last 13 years, um, you know, and since they've, they were founded in 2007, they've actually trained over a thousand artisans and have expanded into multiple communities across Metro Manila. And every piece they make is made from upcycled and overstocked fabrics as well as locally woven textiles. And they've actually upcycled thousands of kilograms of textile waste since they've been around. And like, I do have this one of our pieces here of course to show you just like how beautiful they are, of course. Um, but they truly, their pieces are just colorful and like they truly do weave joyful stories, both in terms of the pieces and the stories that they tell. And for us, we've had the privilege at Cambio to work with Rags to Riches. So we've, um, been able to visit the artisan workshop and you know meet with Reese and the team so this is actually us um, the photo on the right is us the first time we were meeting Reese back in 2017 and then the photo on the left was the last time we went to visit the uh, Rags to Riches workshop which was back in 2018 and actually uh, got to uh, meet some of the artisans as they were weaving um, and each time we go to the R to R headquarters and meet with the team. It's just like such a joyful space. Uh, people, I don't know if anyone has been to the R to R workshop before. Like if you have, 
you know, drop your experience in the chat because like each time Jerome and I have gone, it's always been so joyful. People are greeting us at the workshop artisans are like listening to music as they're crafting the pieces and it's just this beautiful vibe not only of you know of happiness but also just pure like pride and people really feel like you can really sense this pride in terms of the work that they do and um you know and it's just wonderful and so speaking of you know celebrating milestones and finding joy in dark times we are celebrating something really big tomorrow um so Rags to Riches is actually launching their first online store ever in North America in partnership with Cambio and Co. Um, so Nikki will drop the link if you have not yet checked it out. It's r2rshop.com and we are officially launching tomorrow, which is still exciting. And so this means so much uh, to us as a whole team, um, especially I think especially given the fact that we're doing this um, and we're able to achieve something really special during the circumstances in the world that we currently live in. Um, and so we actually have a special little giveaway for you all um, to stay near till the end. <laughs> we're doing a little giveaway. Um, if you stay till the end, you can have a chance to win. Oh, all right. And so what um, we, there's now my honor to actually introduce you to our speaker for the evening. So Reese uh, Fernandez Ruiz is the president and one of the founding partners of Rags to Riches. And, you know, she's a really legit person. <laughs> she's accomplished many wonderful things uh, through ITAR and through her own, um, her personal life as well, and has won tons of awards. You, you can see all the awards that are listed there. But what I think is most impressive about Reese is not necessarily the awards, but about like her humility and her generosity in terms of sharing her wisdom and wanting to truly create opportunities for the people around her. So I've had the honor to really work um, and learn from Reese. And as I think there, we have many Filipinas uh, who are here with us and you know, many of us know how it feels like to not feel seen or represented. And so Reese is one of those people who made me feel seen and represented as a Filipina and as an entrepreneur for the first time. So really excited and she's going to start by telling us a bit about her journey. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Jelaine, for the amazing introduction that I heard of the first time. I'm not even kidding. So it's, uh, wow, that's, um, it, it's such a, a, a good feeling to know that you, you are an ally to someone. So it's really an honor to be your ally. And I'm very honored to be here with the, all of you today. So hi, everyone from Manila. So that's why I'm drinking cold brew coffee. Um, and you're probably with your wine, which I also hope to do, but I couldn't yet. <laughs> so um, good morning or good evening or good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are. Um, today's conversation is something that's very special to me. It's, uh, it's probably the first time that I'm going to talk about it in this way. So I, I hope you learned something from, um, from this conversation because I definitely learned a lot just um, putting it together. Uh, it's almost like a reflection paper, but in a presentation. So um, my, my topic is about joyful resilience. And I have been thinking about this for years uh, because I really believe that resilience is so important. Um, it's something that we have to foster within ourselves. But at the same time, it's also misunderstood. And a lot of people just throw out the word resilience um, as an excuse to not help or to not do something. And so, by the way, you may hear some baby sounds at the background. I can do nothing about that because they're really small kids. So my babies, they're, I have two kids and they shout if they want to. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no bubble it's like the work from home environment um but yeah so again i'm very honored to be here today and i hope you all um, get some inspiration and lessons from the story that i'm about to share today so December 16, 2016. This was our eighth year as a company, and I thought this was our last. Um, a few months before this photo was taken, I was three months pregnant and crying every day because we had to make very difficult decisions in order to give 
our social enterprise a chance to survive. So we had to do some layoffs, we moved offices, um, we cut down a lot of our costs. And yet, even after all those painful decisions, our chances of survival back then was still very slim. So in this photo, you can see me giving a talk. Um, I could remember this day so clearly. I was talking about the past few years, when we, like where we were during that time and what the future looked like. Um, I was sharing our financial report, as I have done every single year since we started. Um, but this time, in this picture, uh, I was sharing it as if it was the diagnosis of a terminal illness. Um, I remember trying to just balance the message about our reality and what we could still hope for, no matter how small. Um, it was the worst year of my life, which really says a lot for me, because I've had a lot of really bad years, but this was still, you know, it takes the cake. So, how the light came through, super long story short, because um, I know we have uh, an hour, an hour and a half to talk, but it still won't be enough to talk about the whole saga that happened back then. But long story short, we made it, and we are still here today. And we made it because highly unlikely things that had to happen happened, and we were ready for them. So it took a lot of support and sacrifices from our team, generosity of some of our partners, and a few fortunate breaks all happening all at the same time. I think one of, the, one of these is a partnership with Cambio. So, but we made it. And there are some of uh, the things that we learned during and after this very challenging year that we thought would break us. Um, we learned what joyful resilience means, and we have carried these lessons with us ever since. Transparency is the first one. It was very important to be honest when it was the hardest to be honest. Um, we have always been transparent with our team and artisans. So every year I would present our financial statements to everyone during our Christmas parties. Um, they love that. They really don't. But I try to make it as fun as possible. Um, and I have shifted the time from before lunch to after lunch to early in the morning just to experiment on the time when they are most awake because I really see people dozing off when I talk about financials, but maybe that's just, um, that's just a reality. Some people just don't really like numbers, but I try to make it as fun as possible because I wanted them to understand our business together and how transparent we want to be, even if it's difficult. So, but last 2016 was different. Um, I had to communicate the very real possibility of not being able to survive as a company, and it was hard. And we had to repeat our message clearly, consistently, and compassionately. Vulnerability. When times are hard, um, it is common to think that we should be harder. Uh, vulnerability has been seen as a weakness, but we have realized that vulnerability is strength. And my vulnerability gave others the strength to process their own emotions. And we got stronger together because we did not deny the difficult emotions and we were able to process it together. Values. We started R2R because of our values, our team members. Um, our team members joined also because of our values and our values really kept us together throughout the years. Um, our culture as a company was built on our values as well. So we built everything on our values and the culture is what we practice every single day. We have these little um, rituals that we do of um, being thankful every beginning of, the meet of our meeting. So we try to do that um, so that our culture and values are not just like writings on our wall, but actually practices that we do in our business. Um, and our culture really proved to us that our values are strong and enduring, especially last 2016. Um, it was easy to uphold values when things were easy, um, but it was more important to uphold them when things got hard. And so we realized that we had a great culture and good values as our foundation when we were able to go through 2016 with everyone just being on the ball and being so compassionate um, for the future of the company. And lastly, hope. Uh, during really, really dark times, it is easier to give in to despair and cynicism, um, but hope takes courage. So as a leader, I knew that even through difficult times, I, I must be able to see the light 
somehow and synthesize it and share it with others. Um, because, but because I was also going through my first pregnancy and childbirth and all the sleepless nights after, I also had to get my dose of hope from those around me. So I got my hope from the compassion of our team, our artisans, the partners who supported us, my husband, who is both a hands-on father and a partner. Um, I synthesized the hope that they all gave me. So our battle cry back then was to fight with 100% of our efforts, even without the guarantee of success. And so we found hopefulness with the outcomes of either coming out of that with a new like, lease in life, um, or with an experience of a lifetime. So either way, giving 100% could only make us better. So we built a better company after that year, slowly but sustainably. So we re also realized what joyful resilience is and what it is not. So while it is about grit, um, holding on, showing up, and giving 100% even without a guaranteed outcome, it is also not about denying reality, avoiding responsibility, and it is absolutely not an excuse to not help others. So we, we hear this a lot, you know, that, um, oh, you don't need to help them because they're resilient, they can take it. Or, oh, there's another typhoon coming, that's fine, Filipinos are resilient. And I think we have just thrown that a lot. Um, sometimes what we, we mean well, but the effect could not be productive and could not be um, empowering for other people because it takes away the responsibility from us. So what do I carry with me now, aside from that pouch? <laughs> Just like Jelaine. Um, this here has been a tough one for so many people. Um, I don't have to say the C word anymore because you kind of all see it everywhere. Um, it has not been easy on us as well, but I believe we're able to get through it now because of the things that we learned back in 2016. So I still go back to my notes and voice memos, and I have a lot of voice memos. They're all very dramatic. I have like crying sounds and yeah, it's just for me anyway, for now. No, it's really just for me, for now. No, okay. Um, I, I do that just to <coughs> remind myself that those times happened and we went through them and we got better because of them. And just the things that I learned along the way, I could just go back to them. Um, with full emotions because of their voice memos. Next time, I would also do videos so that I see my face, but I don't know. It's still quite disturbing for me. So <clears throat> um, as a company, we still have the muscle memory um, built during that difficult year. And so we use it now to make better decisions. Um, as for me, I, I think I have shed a few more pounds of hubris and practiced more humility um, because the reasons why we're still here today had very little to do with my own efforts or talents. Um, we got here because of our team, artisans, partners, and a lot of luck that we just happened to be ready for. So we just made sure that we're ready for, for the luck that came our way. So these days, I make it a point to intentionally lead with lots of gratitude and hope. So what did not kill us? <laughs> made us agile, creative, more compassionate, enterprising, and future-looking. Um, because the thing about joyful resilience is that it builds up great muscles. Um, because of what we went through last 2016, we got better. So what didn't kill us made us stronger. So now, I actually look at 2016 with a lot of kindness now. I used to not like it so much. Like when somebody says, oh, back in 2016, I still get like a, um, a knee-jerk reaction. I still get that uh, feeling of um, trauma when I hear the year 2016, which is a traumatic year for a lot of people for sure. So many elections happened. And I'm like, okay, we also had a very difficult year during that time. But now I look at it with kindness. Because if 2016 did not happen, we would not have been in a position to survive 2020. What we're looking forward to, we're navigating through 2020 armed with everything we know now about ourselves and our capacity for growth. So since the beginning of March, which was when the lockdowns, uh, strict quarantine started in Manila, um, we have been working together but remotely most of the time. Um, our priority is to keep each other safe while keeping livelihood going. Um, because we know that if this time is hard for us, 
it is much harder for those who are already vulnerable before the pandemic. So our artisans and their families have been vulnerable before, um, and we have been working towards um, getting them out of poverty and helping them stay out of poverty, but now that's going to be even more difficult. Um, so while we were all quarantining, um, we have been creating products as well for this hopefully better normal that we are all building. And we have been so fortunate to have advocates from the Philippines who have been supporting us. Um, and we know that we also have advocates from North America supporting Filipino products. And so for those of you who are in this call right now and in the future, if you want to rewatch this, um, I want you to know that it means so much to us and you make us even more excited to open our North America store this October 1. Thanks. I'm surprised I didn't cry. Because when I was like going through the outline, I was tearing up every time I hear 2016. But yeah, I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, thank you so much for that, Reese. Like, I think, um, yeah, like, I think it's always hard to relive those those really challenging, difficult moments. But for sure, you can look back on these hard experiences still with some gratitude. Um, so, yeah, I really love what you talked about, where you talked about, you know, joyful resilience is not. And joyful resilience is not denying reality. It's not toxic positivity. It's really accepting reality and then still choosing, choosing to still be joyful and allowing that joy to fuel your resilience. So that's amazing. Um, and I would like to invite everyone, you know, we will do a formal Q&A after, or not formal, like a, a Q&A, Q&A, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get your ball again. Um, <laughs> no, we'll do an actual Q&A after the audience, um, but for now we'll just have like, Reese and I, uh, we're gonna have a little discussion, but you are all, if you have questions throughout, drop them into the chat and, you know, we'll try to incorporate your questions throughout the conversation. Um, but I actually want to ask you, because one of the things that you mentioned was how, um, you know, RTR was able to make it through, not necessarily because of like talent, but because of, of luck and fortune, but being ready to act when that luck came about or when the, mm -hmm. when the tides turned your way. So can you talk a little bit about like what that means of like, how, how were you ready? Like how, yeah, how were you and the team ready when things became better? Yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, uh, we, uh, it was, it was difficult because when you're in the middle of pain, it's very hard to process. Um, but it's something that you also have to do uh, as a leader. And you know that a lot of um, things and people depend on your leadership. But I drew a lot of strength from our team and artisans. So we all talked about it together. We all identified um, what it looks like for us to get out of this. So we were hopeful and we identified very specific things that we needed to get out of where we were. And that really helped. Because then when luck happened, we recognized them and we're like, yeah, that's what we're looking for. We're going to, we're ready for them. So, cause it's, it's, it's hard to, um, I guess it's hard to identify the right opportunities, um, when they come and then when they come and you don't recognize them, you won't be able to take them on. So mm -hmm. for us, it was about, um, looking at where we were and being honest about ourselves that we're in pain, that we are in a very difficult situation. But it was also about looking at the possibilities out there and saying, these are the opportunities that we need. And we know that some of them are very difficult to come by, but when they do happen, we will recognize them and then we will pounce in a kind way. <laughs> and we're like, okay, <laughs> this is the opportunity that we need. So, so yeah, yeah it, it helped that we work with a team to identify them and that's mm -hmm. how we became ready for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something from our conversations together, like we always, that conversation about grit always comes up and yeah. how grit, grit is more important than talent at the end of the day. And it's because of exactly those things. There's so many things that are out of your control. And, but truly failure only is failure when you choose to give up. And so, yeah, so that just like relates so much to the things that you've taught me actually. And that, um, yeah. And that Candia has also learned over the last five years of, of 
try almost shutting down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Trying and trying again and almost having like a shutdown almost every year and still <laughs> choosing and having the conviction um, to still move forward. Um, I'd actually love to ask you about, you know, how R2R R has this unique culture and this unique company that is, it's so, it is so joyful. Like, you know, everything is, it just has this beautiful story and the, like you said, it's the co company culture that helped get you through 2016 mm -hmm. and that's helping R2R R survive now this year. So how is it that you actually, um, like, how did you actually build that culture in the first place? Like what? what were those steps or like how did how did that happen yeah so we've been around for the past 13 years right so it has a it had a lot of iterations already um i also changed um on my own like along the way um when r to r started i was very young so i didn't really know anything about building a company or building a company culture or leading people um everything was learned through experience but i think um it helped that i had a uh, like a lot of mentors or leaders to look up to um, who would tell me you should be open, uh, you should ask more questions. And by this roadmap of just asking rather than a roadmap of answers, um, I was able to uh, get to know the team and see where we are heading. So it all first started with why we were um, doing our company, why we are, why we're in this company in the first place. So it started with our why, and then we defined also the how, like the values, like how are we going to now fulfill our mission? It doesn't make sense that we fulfill such a beautiful mission, but in a very um, toxic way, you know? So it doesn't make sense that we support community artisans and we want to empower them and we want to create more opportunities and yet we are so exclusive we are toxic to each other we talk behind each other's backs it's just it's just, it just doesn't make sense it so we thought you know if since we're doing this we have to do this right it's not enough that our mission is beautiful um the way we execute it should be just as beautiful just as empowering just as values driven so that's that's how we started um, our team started identifying the things that will support our why, um, how it would be, how it would, um, how our practices and our values would support the mission that we are going for. Um, we wrote it down, we wrote it down again, we iterated, um, and then we created um, rituals and practices on each value that we could do in the company on a daily basis so that we don't forget so that it's just not you know a nice pinterest pinteresty quote or something that we post on instagram but it's something that we practice every day so for example one of the things that we identified is to start everything with gratefulness and so it's easy to say it's easy to put on a on a nice background and just post on instagram but we thought you know we should do it every meeting so before we start every meeting we start with a round of thankfulness as well and that has helped set the tone for a lot of our meetings and a lot of what we do and and we have the same principles applied to all of our different um, values and what we call culture code mm, amazing um in terms of the thankfulness round we've actually started doing that at candio as well and actually nikki was previously an intern at rags to riches before she began working with cambio so um yeah we bought r to r all throughout um <laughs> but it makes me <laughs> yeah i think i think it's what you it just makes so much sense like culture and social impact if we're talking about making a real and sustainable and like meaningful impact in our communities it's not just it can't just be an afterthought it can't just be like salt that you sprinkle at the end of a meal like it has to be something that you layer in into every single action and every single yeah, every single practice and ritual like you're saying and if yeah and if i may add um i think it's also important to always be honest with yourself and your team mm. um be transparent so we don't claim that we are 100 percent there like we don't say that we're 100 percent um, like our values are amazing, like our sustainability is just 100% because there's really no such thing. Um, but you could only be honest about where you are, um, where you're lacking and what you're doing about it. 
um, and not say that we have everything figured out. So I think that has helped a lot, that kind of honesty. Um, because honesty <clears throat> is what is what builds trust. So our team members trust each other and they trust the company because they know that if we're not there yet, we're gonna say it. We're like, yeah, we're using um, like this material because we couldn't uh, search for this other material just yet, but here's what we're doing um, to get to that material. So mm -hmm. we're also honest about the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and embracing the imperfection. Oh, yes. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I think I'm I'm sure there are quite a few mamas in here in our in our yeah. group. Um and maybe even some who are moms and then also entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and true passion. And, you know, um you you've always been very open of like the challenge of also having your first baby at the same time as like this really challenging period. Um and like, how, how do you look back on that now? And like, how has being a parent changed your perspective in terms of, in terms of being a leader and in terms of resilience itself? Huh. I think, well, I learned a lot from being a mom, for sure. Uh, for one thing, I learned that I had so much free time before and I didn't <laughs> use it well. <laughs> and now um, I, I just cram so much in a day uh, and I cram so much in my brain as well. Um, it's overwhelming, but at the same time, uh, I welcome it. Um, but what I realize is I, it, I now pay more attention to the kind of leader I am and to the kind of leaders that we have. And I'm just more particular about the leaders that I support openly and support on my own and just look at as examples because now i'm very conscious about how my kids when they see something they just follow it <laughs> they just do it and it's very scary um and at the same time encouraging because that means that we could really set a good example and we could continue conversations um so i think it's a it's a very interesting time to be raising children um during this crisis <laughs> on so many fronts um but i think there's still some hope there and and so i draw some hopefulness there um from from the people like you people in this call uh in this kwentuhan um i draw hope that you know my kids are gonna grow up in a in a better world somehow even if it doesn't look great right now mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I am going to switch things up a little bit and I am going to bring this back to our community. So we actually at the start when you were all registering, we asked you to share some of your um, practices in terms of how you cultivate, um, you all cultivate joy during dark times. So some of you uh, shared um, when you uh, yeah when you signed up we got quite a few answers and they were really beautiful and there were actually a lot that i couldn't even fully go through all of them just yet um but they were wonderful and so i would invite you all if you didn't get a chance to uh, do that before please like drop a response in the chat but here are some of the things that you all shared and they were just wonderful so some of the ways that you and your community cultivate joy during dark times is by reading and journaling and reflection, um, meditation, staying in sisterhood, um, you know, knowing negative emotions and events are temporary. That's so, so true. Like everything is temporary, I think. Um, both joyful feelings and then also negative feelings. Um, infinite spring cleaning, yes. Kwentuhan with family and friends, just like Kwentuhan with Cambio, which is lovely. I think there is so much power in community, performing acts of kindness, listening to my body, choosing gratitude and celebrating the small wins and achievements. Um, there are quite, there are so many and they're just wonderful. Um, and so I just wanna see some of the things that you are, you're all saying in the chat um, in terms of how you foster dancing, um, Ashley spends time cuddling with her fur babies, dancing to music that speaks to me. Um, yeah, doing movement, physical movement, keeping a routine slash ritual, uh, praying, staying rooted in my faith. Um, 
one of the ones that I really loved was thinking about my blessings and the hardship my family has gone through that led me to where I am today. Through these difficult times, there is hope and there is light. Um, and just learning, I think, from our past hardships, like Reese, you've been saying, and thinking like, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger and having so much conviction in that. Um, yeah, doing something creative, making something. Um, yeah, we, I know quite a few people in this group are super creative. Like we have a few friends here who are like artists themselves who are, you know, incredibly talented. And I know there's so much healing power in, in our creativity. Uh, reframing, Melissa says here, um, reframing challenges as gifts and trying to find the lessons in the struggle. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Whew. And then one of the ones, of course, which relates to us all here together is being in community with my Kumares and maintaining strong connections during difficult times. Um, I think, yeah, there's so much joy in, in sisterhood, joy in community. And, you know, we, one of the powers of joy is, is fostering the sense of unity and the sense of like that we're not alone and that we are strong together. So, so yeah, so these are some of the wonderful responses um, that we got from our community. And so Reese, I would like to know how do you uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, like what is your practice or your ritual in terms of cultivating joy on a, on a regular, on a day-to-day? -day? Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on. Uh, okay, there. Uh, okay, there. I accidentally mm -hmm. muted myself. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I I do a lot, um, and there are some new things that I learned during this lockdown. Uh, I still haven't learned how to cook or bake, unfortunately, but at least there are small businesses that we're supporting by buying a lot of baked goods. Um, I uh, I've been dancing recently in the morning. Um, to the tune of BTS songs, and I have no shame <laughs> admitting that I love BTS. And um, I also, like, during the workday, I just make sure to have some time um, to take small breaks. And then at night, because um, I still breastfeed my little one, I have a, he's gonna turn one year old soon. And um, his time to sleep is at 7 p.m. So from 7 to 10, uh, I, I used that time to watch my K-dramas. And yes, I'm ARMY. Baby ARMY, but <laughs> but getting there. Hopefully without spending a lot, but yeah. <laughs> okay, I have no idea. I'm so out of the <gasps> BTS loop. I'm gonna send you links. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> people are like... This is my like, excited face. People have like, strong reactions about ARMY. <laughs> I know, of course. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I expect nothing. Um, well. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That's so funny. I think you just got some lifelong fans, Reese. It's probably the most. Um, yeah, it's probably <laughs> because of BTS. Yeah, so you're like, oh, you're you're creating like social enterprise. Great. Oh my gosh, your army. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the <laughs> exactly. one. Exactly. That is what's important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I need to get on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have thousands of followers right now. Anyway. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I love hearing about how people, I think people have different ways of coping. And one of the things, um, I got a few responses to that were really interesting and people have been sharing like, I don't really know how I how to cultivate joy and some of the ways that people respond to, to grief or to trauma is to just keep super busy and to stay distracted. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if you are feeling that way, um, that is totally valid. Like I think, I think that we do what we do what we need to do in order to get through and to see another day and um yeah even if your your way of coping is not starting a new side hustle and uh, creating this brand new business like there's that is absolutely valid and yeah. don't let anyone make you feel otherwise um yeah and so something um and again would love to invite you all drop your questions in the chat throughout um but I think one of the things that I would love to ask you is like, how do you impart or inspire like the same kind of joyful resilience in others? Hmm. 
aside from sending you links to BTS. Yes. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's not part of it, or is it? Um, sure it is. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just allowing people to cope and not judging their way of coping. Um, mm. Like uh, I like for example, and I and I don't want to repeat this just because I want to repeat this. For example, BTS. Um, instead of like, because I got really curious about my younger friends and other like friends my age who have been like raving about them. Um, but instead of saying, oh, it's just you know um, a distraction, like don't do that, just do something productive. I I'm like more open to it, and I'm like, oh, what's 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 in here? What do they find joy here? And I found joy there too. And I think there are so many things like that in our lives that if we're just a bit more open, then we could, in a way, um, give other people space to find their joy because you're not judging them. And for all you know, you can also find your joy in what they find joyful. So for me, it's just less judgment and more, um, more openness and more love and more sense of community. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's how we do it for our team. So for my team, for example, um, we exchange um, ideas about uh, how we spend our weekends or what we do for fun, and just letting people enjoy what they enjoy. <laughs> it's um, um, yeah, it's a way of loving them, and that's that's I think how we're able to do it and. At the same time, I also share um, my own experiences and also my practices that help, just in case it will help other people too and if it fits their way of coping. So, like for example, my, my way of coping is always writing. Um, mm -hmm. I write things down in my digital journal just to make sure that you know I could go back to it one day and reflect on it and just realize mm -hmm. how, far, how far I've come. So, I try to encourage other people to find that for them. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really powerful. I think for myself, I write. I also write to help process a lot of difficulties, and I started doing that um, five years ago when we started Cameo because every every day was like a roller coaster, and you know, yeah. some days were definitely it was definitely hard to to find the to find the energy or the will to get out of bed. And so like, I've been right, I just write. And since the pandemic, I've actually been writing three long form pages every morning. Um, so about an hour of just writing everything mm -hmm. that comes into my head. And I think it's been interesting to catch some of the negative self-talk that happens a lot in my head. <laughs> I can be very, very mean, not to mm -hmm. other people, but really mean to myself. And I think writing it out and seeing it in writing can has been a really powerful way like, to catch that and to catch those those things before they fester and yeah. explode <laughs> i have head. a i have a hack for that too because i do that i used to do that a lot like i have a lot of mm. negative self-talk and so i do that right i do the negative self-talk and then i reply to myself oh with, um, so you talk yeah. back to yourself <laughs> yeah so myself talked about myself in a bad way so myself backstab myself or front stab whatever and then i would just like go reply like have another like paragraph just to reply to that other self mm. yeah yeah i'm not weird but... <laughs> um oh amazing that's a that's an excellent question um oh so... yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, yeah, let's get into. Whew, that's true. Um, yeah, some thoughts on how you set boundaries to protect yourself from toxic energy from others while still remaining open to opposing ideas. This is such a relevant question. Melissa. This is such a Thanks social media this. question, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it is. There's so many angles that this goes in. Um, yeah. yeah, would you like, how would you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Melissa. I have practiced this over the past few months. <laughs> so, um, G great question, and I think it's something that I'm still in the middle of answering and practicing myself. Um, so what I realize is uh, it really depends on the other person. Like, is this person like somebody like really important to you, super close to you? Because um, in my case, my Facebook is filled with like half the people who I don't agree with at all um, when it comes to 
leadership and political leanings and just sense of justice. I could go on and on. Um, so what I did was, especially during the beginning of this pandemic when everything is toxic outside the house and in the internet, um, before unfriending or blocking, <laughs> I evaluate first if you know this person I have a relationship with in person and that maybe we could have a conversation after this is all done and we could have a conversation face to face or talk via a direct message because people are more aggressive on the wall than they are on the private message. So when you call them out in front of a lot of people, of course people tend to get defensive, right? But if you go to your direct message and try to have a better conversation, people really re reply differently than how they would if it's in front of like everyone else. They try to mm -hmm. look like they're winning. So, and it's not about winning. It's about understanding each other. Um, mm -hmm. So, but if I realize that this Facebook friend is not somebody I know and I have just a bad habit in the beginning of just accepting anyone <laughs> as a Facebook friend, then I just block and unfriend. I don't need that kind of toxic energy in my, in my feed. So I, really, I think it really depends on your priorities and on your relationships that you want to keep. Um, but I also understand that you, know, you want to still be open to opposing ideas and constructive criticism, which um, would bring me to the next point of looking at the, the opposing ideas. Does it come in a form of a meme or fake news then yeah there's no use um talking to that um talking to that person anymore because there's nothing that would convince them and mm -hmm. you would just waste your energy or is yeah. it an opening to actually um, have better conversations mm -hmm. yeah i think this is yeah i agree i'm one of those people too where i don't know i think it's the way many of us are raised <laughs> in terms of like especially as a woman it's feeling like you need to accommodate everyone or be welcoming and make everyone feel welcome and i've had to really consciously unlearn that instinct to try to make someone feel comfortable because sometimes if we're talking about fundamental human rights or human dignity like it is not on me to make you feel comfortable when you are insulting someone's dignity and I think something um, that I've learned recently is I've been, I, I listened to the Brene Brown podcast, which is excellent, called Unlocking it Us, is. and she interviews an, uh, an author, uh, Glennon Doyle, who wrote Unseen. I haven't read the book yet, but it was such a good episode um, on that podcast. And yes, it's so good, Fairy. Yeah, it's so good. Um, nice. And one of the things that they talk about in that episode is kind of like having, thinking of yourself as an island where not not an island where you isolate yourself but an island in terms of you get to choose when you let the drawbridge down to let people in and that on that island you are the one who gets to control the kind of ideas or yeah the kind of ideas are the kind of people that you want to allow on your island and for me i used to think that it was my job to like let everyone on the island and like let everyone um yeah to just adapt myself to the people around me and I think that's still something that I that is natural for many of us but I think what you realize is like you can still set those boundaries and that sometimes there are things on your that just have no place on that island and that will change for everyone but some things for me is like I just will not tolerate anyone who you know who doesn't believe that race, racism exists like that is not a conversation I'm interested in having with people in my life and um and I think that that's okay Right. Yeah. And I think that that's okay for many of us is to acknowledge like we don't have to let everyone in. But of course, of course, you still need to have an open mind, but not necessarily about fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I think, I've kind of started to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I super agree with you on that because there are just some things that you can't argue, like the human dignity. You can't argue that. Um, justice, human rights. Uh, at the same time, there are some, I think there are some people who are just products of their past and their upbringing. And sometimes when I see 
that they're actually open to a conversation and that maybe it's the start for them to change their minds about something or even change their behaviors, then I still engage. But there is a difference between being curious and being open mm -hmm. and just yeah. wanting to shove their ideas down your throat because they think mm -hmm. that, you know, you're being too sensitive. You, when people say that you're being too sensitive, that just means that they used to get away with saying bad things and now they don't and they don't like it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. this, this whole thing yeah. is about um, processing that difference, just knowing that difference. Yeah, for sure. Um, amazing questions that I see coming into the group. And so um, we will get into, I'm so excited to get into some of them, but before um, we do, I just want to, um, we'll take a little quick pause, but I just want to link this back to this idea of joy as an act of resistance. And because one of the ways that we choose to express joy is to wear your heritage. Um, you know, I think fashion can mean many things to different people and fashion is not a source of joy for many people. But the way that I've always looked at fashion is like, this is a chance to express yourself. And not only in terms of the aesthetic, but also express yourself in terms of what you're choosing to put on your body and the stories that those things that you're putting on your body tell. And so, you know, joy is an act of resistance, wearing your heritage and choosing to be proud and go out there and be seen fully, um, you know, proud of your culture and where you come from, like that is joy. That is an act of joy, that is an act of resistance and being and feeling so proud of that. Um, so yeah, thank you all for like being here and sharing and taking the time to, to cultivate our joy as a community and part of that joy is also a giveaway so uh, i promise you all those who stuck near the end um would get a little surprise so uh, remember r to r shop.com is launching tomorrow morning um, and you can actually find out as soon as we launch so there is r to r shop.com and you can sign up for the newsletter and then we're giving away for someone here an 80 dollar a digital gift card to send and hopefully be our first official customer so you have to like Yay. be ready <laughs> um, but uh, we just chose someone um from the group and the person who will be getting the prize is i just wrote down a person's name is kara palanca from california if i'm not mistaken uh or I think I wrote it down in a scribble. <laughs> um, Kara Palanca from California is our um, winner of our giveaway. So we'll reach out to Kara. Congratulations. Afterwards. Congratulations. Yay. All right. And so we are going to take a quick little break. Um, just we're, we have left love audience Q&A with you all and answering some of your questions. So we'll meet back in like two minutes, just like time to do whatever you need. Oh, um, I think actually, I'm gonna choose a new winner from the giveaway because oh. I think Kara left. Um, oh, so okay. we're, I'm gonna just randomly choose Vera from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Vera's still around, yay. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to take a little break about two minutes and in the meantime if you have questions then please drop your questions into the chat or through the q a and then we will meet back here in like at 906 that's cool and do a uh, q a for about 15 minutes yay so we'll see you back refill your drinks refill your drinks i really i really yeah. love the the comments though like i know we're taking yeah. a break but i'm like just yeah. reading through the yeah. so many. Thanks so oh. much, everyone, for being here. Yeah. Yeah, send us more questions because we're so good. You can ask yeah. Reese about her BTS questions. Oh, God. <laughs> then we'll need Is three this more your... hours. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your first obsession with a Korean band? No. Yeah, I'd say yes. But I, I usually yeah. don't have... Um, I'm not a part of any fandom ever since I was young. I don't really get attached to any fandom. So this is the closest. And that already says a lot because I don't like binge watch everything, but I, I really like them. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to get into it. I'm very it uncool. It just sparks joy. <sighs> it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You do you. I mean, podcasts are cool, That's too. True. That's I true. Love, podcasts I love are podcasts. Cool. Oh, podcasts. I love podcasts. Podcasts are cool. Podcasts are cool. Fairy and I will listen to uh, Brene Brown. <laughs> oh, I love really Brene Brown. Yeah. And I also <laughs> love On Being. Except sometimes because her voice is just so soothing. I can't, I can't being. do it while on bed. Because Ooh. then I will be on dreamland um yeah i'm gonna be sleeping after because her voice is just amazing and but the thoughts are great so yeah on being yeah renee's renee's voice is cool too (laughs) (laughs) awesome oh somebody asked oh somebody asked that somebody is nikki who's my bias in bt yeah in bts Hmm. so my bias used to be jungkook but now it's um it's very difficult to choose so I'll need another session to just have like an evaluation on the bias. I love them all, um, but yeah, Jungkook and V. I have no idea what a bias is, so sorry. <laughs> We're moving it's just on. Your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's okay. your favorite. Um, yeah. So it's nine oh six. Great. I know we kept on talking, but it wasn't real. I mean, it was still real, but just not <laughs> part of the program. So we're going to go BTS, right into so questions. Yeah, it's not. Um, <laughs> okay, so we got some awesome questions. Um, the first one for, is from Isabella. So uh, during times when you feel lost or doubtful of yourself in your journey towards joyful resilience, how do you remind yourself of your what and why? It's a great question. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to answer that first? <laughs> um, that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that, um, well, first, the what is iterative. I think the what is always has to come from your why. And so I think that when, that you can't be stuck with a what in terms of what you're doing, because that has to change if you're really committed to your mission and your why. And I think that in terms of reminding yourself of your why, like, I think it's just, I don't know. It just comes with daily practice. Like, I think if you are so accustomed to thinking about your why and and your social purpose and the impact that you want to create, and you are really intentional about sprinkling that in to your day-to-day work, then it becomes very easy. Like, that becomes that just becomes a part of living and breathing as a human being and as a business that exists for, for a purpose. So I don't think necessarily you need to remember your why if it's, if it's truly your why that resonates with you. Um, and it's actually during difficult times I found that it was our why that got us through COVID when COVID really hit. Like it was our why that kept us stable. And if we didn't have that conviction in terms of our work and the importance of our work, like I, I think we would have crumbled. Yeah. So, yeah. So for us, all that, definitely the same. Um, I'm also going to give you a few like practical hacks that you could do um, on your own. So aside from writing down, because writing down is super, has been super helpful. So sometimes when you write down and just reply to yourself, that, that helps. Um, and also a power playlist. During the during the most difficult times of R to R, I looked for like playlists on Spotify, and I also built my own. It's called Entrepreneurship Hustle or something like that. You should share know. that with our group. I know I could. Yeah, I could. I could. <laughs> I, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna send that to you guys. But yeah, it's a it's a playlist that just pumps me up and makes me feel good about um, the work. So when mm. I like just put my headphones on and I just listen to that playlist after writing down all of my frustrations, it, it helps mm-hmm. me get through the day. Yeah. So those are yeah. like, yeah, aside from um, like really being uh, intentional about, mm-hmm. uh, about the work that you do, but you're right, Jelaine, um, the what could really change, like just the why remains. Like for us in r to r so we make bags, right? So when the pandemic happened, we're like, okay, nobody's going out. So nobody really needs bags, at least here in Manila, where the lockdown was really strict. So we're like, yeah, but our whole why is creating opportunities for artisans. What does that have to do with bags at all? It could be something else. 
And so we weren't precious about um, the form that it took. We weren't precious about the product itself, but we were precious about keeping to our mission. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think also something I would add to that is just like the importance of community and surrounding yourself with people who really truly inspire you, but also hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, I'm very fortunate because I have this amazing circle both in Toronto, but also, you know, in Philippines, we have amazing partners who, who have guided us through. And I think if you surround yourself with people who can really hold you accountable and also inspire you like that, that makes things a lot easier to get through dark times. Um, yeah, so that was a wonderful question. I love that. Um, we also have I think this isn't necessarily a question, but it's just uh, a lovely, like a, an important comment from Ashley, who um, Ashley says, I really like that you recognize the need to challenge mainstream societal definitions of resilience. Um, resilience in the mainstream is always framed a certain way. And that, you know, especially when we apply the, the word resilience to the Filipino community, it's, there's always, you always have to take it with a grain of salt because yeah, I think we all kind of know. Yeah. So um, what Ashley is saying is like it's it's important that we challenge that mainstream definition of what resilience is, and that it can be joyful, and that it can be an act of resistance as well. Um, yeah, and I think something that I've also been thinking a lot about is like you know there's a lot of guilt that I think many of us feel, especially many of us who are you know who are safe who are maybe in, even in that stage of growth right now. Um, and we feel a lot of guilt because of, because of our privilege compared to what others don't have. And I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, we contain multitudes of human beings. Like we can feel guilt and we can feel sadness and we can feel fear and anger, but we can also feel pride and we can feel joy at, all at the same time as full human beings and that none of those emotions necessarily negate the other one. Um, and resilience is all part of that as well. So, yeah. yeah, I believe this so much. You know, I remember a few years ago, I was giving a talk in the Sydney Opera House and I was talking about, yeah, I mean, it was a big deal, but I really made a mess. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, I'm saying the place because it's a big deal where I made a mess and I'm like, um, there's a typhoon coming in the Philippines, but you know, I don't think it's a big deal because there are 20 plus typhoons coming in the Philippines anyway, and Filipinos are resilient, blah, blah, blah. The next day, it happened. That was, that was Typhoon Haiyan and it devastated so many communities, killed so many people. And I just brushed it off on a global stage, um, the day before it happened. So it was um, such a huge learning experience and a very humbling one, um, very painful to admit. Um, but I think, you know, personal behavior changes happen painfully and it will only happen if you admit something that you did wrong, something that you said wrong, even if you said it in a global stage with so many global leaders. Um, yeah, so I, I cringe every time I think about that, but I don't allow myself to forget it because I'm like, mm -hmm. Um, that's an example for me of how um, you could be wrong and then you could say sorry for being wrong like genuinely and try to really change mm -hmm. um, and that's also like personally that's what my own resilience is coming from it's not from protecting myself from all the negative emotions or the, the mistakes that I did and just feeling you know, okay about it, or just saying, you know, I'm going to be defensive and I'm just going to protect myself. I'm resilient. That's not what res resilience is about. Um, resilience is also about you evolving and you changing and you being comfortable with the fact that you were wrong and that you're going to make it right. So it's just not about self-protection that you can't feel bad. You don't want to feel bad. That you, want, you don't want to be called racist or you don't want to be called discriminatory. Um, because at some point in our lives, we, we were, uh, we created pain. We inflicted pain on others. And mm -hmm. yeah. it's okay to admit that and change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, feel, so cringe. feeling like, all of that. <laughs> 
Yeah. I think many of us, I think all of us can relate to those cringeworthy moments. And like, honestly, I think, um, like you said, it's like, you can never, you can learn from things, you can move on from them, but you cannot forget them. And it's what's important is that we allow those experiences to change us for the better. Um, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And, um, and then we have a question from Jing. Um, Jing says lovely things. Thank you, Jing, for also Thank being you. here and being so open and positive as well. Um, so how do you continue to stay optimistic and centered while maintaining work-life balance? Juggling so many unknowns, going to 2020, how will you, well, first let's answer that. How do we stay centered and optimistic um, while juggling so many things? Um, yeah. Start. Go, go, go for it. <laughs> Are you, um, from the practical sense, um, from the practical sense, I have my bullet journal, which is like my best friend, and that has helped me balance both long term projects and then also like short term day to day things. So that's definitely um, helped keep me, I guess, like helped me centered in terms of my priorities um, because there is so much going on. Um, yeah, there's just so much going on. But I think that, so I think that having clear priorities is always really important. Um, because if you know what's important, then you're able to make the right decisions when things get really hard and when things get overwhelming, you know what to focus on. Um, and then in terms of being optimistic and like, I actually don't think of myself as an optimist. I'm of the two of us, of between me and Jerome, Jerome is an optimist and I'm kind of like a pessimistic <laughs> human being. Um, <laughs> which a lot of people are, uh, it's surprising, but I think, um, I don't know. I think it's, I think, I think it's a belief that our actions can create impact in the world, even if it's a small impact. And even if it's just with the people all around us that I just truly believe, like, even if I cannot save the world, um, or I can't, you know, determine the next outcome of the election, I can, I can support my friends and family who are also working to make the world better. Like I can, you know, yeah, like I can try to make the day easier for someone who is, who is out there and that that is something that is within my control. And so I think, I think that's something that has kept me grounded. And because it's like, you might not be able to change the world out there, but you have to be able to believe you can do something. And I, and I think that's what, yeah, that's, that's how you continue to have hope if you believe that you can still do something, anything. You know, it's interesting that you said mm. that um, between the two of you, Jerome is the optimistic one and you're the pessimistic one. I, I think in any relationship, there is just one person who's more geared towards being optimistic and one who's a little bit more towards the other side. Um, so in our relationship, I'm the optimist So um, with my husband, but he's, he's also an optimist, but he's just a, a prepper as well. Like he has a lot of like backup plans and stuff like that. Um, I do have backup plans too, but towards the other side, like towards if things get better, these are the things that are gonna, we're going to do. Um, so for me, when, while well, Jelaine has the bullet journal, I have something similar, but it's on Google Sheets. Um, I love Google Sheets so much. I could go on and on about Google Sheets. I have Google Sheets for everything, um, except for like BTS links, because there's an existing Google Sheet for that. <laughs> so <laughs> I will just, you know, bookmark that. Um, I have a to-do to -do list Google Sheet, so I've been using that for eight years, um, and it has everything. It has work stuff, family stuff, personal stuff. I put everything there because a to-do list is for you to do in your life. So it's not just about work. It's about everything in your life as well. So I put a category on health, a category on family, on homeschooling. <laughs> uh, Okay, that's a sad thought because I'm doing homeschooling and it's not fun. So, so yeah, but I have those categories in a list and I go through them every day. Um, so that has been uh, keeping me productive and I don't forget things because I, I realized when I look at myself, I know that I get the most frustrated when I forget things um, and, or when I don't follow through on a commitment because I forgot it. And so I try not to forget it. So the hack is to do it on Google Sheets. 
so it's always yeah. um updated <laughs> yeah you keep track of it um yeah for sure i think diversify um, i think that's the other mm -hmm. question yeah how will we diversify moving forward yeah so for r to r um i think during the second week of the lockdown uh, we talked to like our design team convened already via via Zoom, and we talked about the different products of the new normal. Um, that was the last thing that we wanted to talk about, honestly, because we knew that there were more urgent things that we have to think of. But at the same time, if we don't think about it, then it will just catch up to us, and then our artisans will not have livelihood in the future. And we take that very seriously as well. So we had to think about the pivots that we had to do so that we could still provide livelihood to our artisans. So we started creating face masks right away, um, just rapidly did some research to make sure that it's safe enough. It's not medical grade because the medical grade has to be done in a medical grade facility and we are not a medical grade facility. So we just uh, had to make sure it's uh, safe enough for daily use. And then we started making loungewear. We started making um, bags for the new normal. Um, Is home this loungewear what you're wearing right now? Yeah. Yeah, so it's um, our multi-wear, uh, like, wrap, wrap, wrap top. Yes. Ooh, it's amazing. breastfeeding friendly. <laughs> oh, ooh, even yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful. The, the pieces are beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. I am mindful of the time. So uh, um, thank you all for your questions. And I think there were even a couple that we weren't able to get to. But I would invite all of you to um yeah i would invite all of you to continue to connect with us um past this evening and past this platform because this is really just this is really just a platform for one conversation but really what we hope today is like to be creating a space for all of us um and to be able to learn from each other and i think one of the best ways in terms of fostering resilience and joy is is in community and in sisterhood um, and so as we're wrapping up, I want to quote Reese, because <laughs> she's very quotable. And this oh, is actually yeah. from an interview that we did back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then I just read it. I was reading it through the other day and I was like, this is super relevant. So, um, so as Reese said, I think the question was- I said um, this? No, I'm kidding. Yes. I think I remember saying this. <laughs> um, I think the question was like, how do you, hope to move forward um or what are what are your hopes for for the future in terms of the philippines or in terms of the philippine community so Reese's response was we are wounded but wonderful renegade and resilient challenged in so many ways but still compassionate i don't know how our story will sound like decades from now but i'm committed to being one of those who will write it that inspires others in the future and i think i just wanted to end off our evening with this thought because i think it is so empowering and it's so important and so powerful and super relevant to 2020 because this is just what 2020 is. We don't know, none of us know what will happen in the future. Um, none of us know what will happen to us in the future. And I think that, I think that part of joyful resilience is trusting that, that we can continue to be here for each other and for, and continue to take care of ourselves so we can show up as our whole selves. So, so thank you all, Maraming Salamat, for being here. Um, the recording will be released, and we hope you, that you do keep in touch. So we'll be sending the recording as soon as um, in the next few days. So you can please follow us at Cambio underscore Co, Rags to Riches, Inc. Um, you can connect with me personally at Julian Santiago on Instagram. Uh, Nikki has dropped the links. And then we also have Reese's Instagram that you can connect with her. She's always dropping lots of wisdom on her IG. Um, <laughs> So we do hope that you'll continue the conversation and connect with us all directly. So thank you all for being here and making the time. And yes, we hope you, we hope we helped inspire you, um, or at least help you felt help you feel seen for today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.